Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for joining us in the Hadith class. Today, inshallah, we will start with the first session of the second semester. And we are starting with the introduction of Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari. In this semester, what we will try to do, inshallah, is to discuss and study Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. The best two books after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll start with Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari. And the first thing we will discuss is the biography of Imam al-Bukhari, his life, his books. We will start with his name, his birth, his character, and his trips in seeking knowledge. That's what we will discuss today, inshallah. His name, what's the name of Imam al-Bukhari? Exactly, Muhammad ibn Ismail. Muhammad ibn Ismail. That's his name and his father's name. But you have to know all these names. Muhammad ibn Ismail, ibn Ibrahim, ibn al-Mughira, ibn Bardizba al-Ju'fi. Look how many names. Six names. Muhammad ibn Ismail, ibn Ibrahim, ibn al-Mughira, ibn Bardizba al-Ju'fi. Each name has a story. Okay, that's why you need to know these names. Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Mughira ibn Bardizba al-Ju'fi. He was born in Bukhara. That's where the name came. Nowadays, if you tell people like Muhammad ibn Ismail, they may not know whom you're talking about. But when you tell them al-Bukhari, they will know that it is al-Imam al-Bukhari. Yes. Why? Anyway, so that's his name. He was born in the year 194 of Hijra. That's when he was born. And you need to know his year of birth. So he was not born so late after the Messenger wasallam. Less than 200 years. He was born in the year 194 of Hijra. His grandfather, and that's why I told you you need to know the name, Al-Mughira. Al-Mughira, his grandfather's father, okay? Or his great-grandfather, because his name is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Al-Mughira. Was a fire worshipper, but he embraced Islam. So you know where Muhammad ibn Ismail rahimahullah came from. His great-grandfathers, they were what? Fire worshippers. But his great-grandfather, he embraced Islam, and that's where his greatness came from. Bardizba, now this is the other name. name. Bardizba means the peasant or the farmer. So we have Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al mughira that's the story of Al-Mughira, he was Muslim. And then Ibn Bardizba, Bardizba is the farmer. Al-Ju'fi. What's the appellation or what's the nickname of Imam Al-Bukhari? Abu Abdullah. Abu Abdullah, he is the father of Abdullah. That was his nickname. That's why many times, Qalahu Abu Abdullah. Usually when they say Abu Abdullah, it could mean many names, but... Mainly, it means Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. He was granted the title, a very unique title in Hadith, the Commander of Faithful in Hadith, Amir Al-Mu'mineen Fil Hadith. Now, if you look through the history of Hadith in Islam, who is the greater scholar that you could say he is the greatest one in Hadith? Usually, Imam Al-Bukhari. Imam Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. Yes, Imam Ahmad was a great scholar in Hadith. Ali ibn al-Madini was a great scholar. But if you want one only, you could say Imam al-Bukhari. And again, that's why his book is the greatest book. There is no greater book than Sahih al-Bukhari. All Ummah, all nation of Islam agreed on that. I, I'm showing you a map to know where he was born. Bukhara. Look at this map. This is Russia here, and down here you have Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. He was born here in this 
what is known nowadays as Uzbekistan. Look at it. This is Uzbekistan. On the south here, you have Pakistan and Afghanistan, Iran on the, on the southwest. So this is Uzbekistan. So I hope now it's clear the, uh, the area where, where he was born. That's Uzbekistan. And more specifically, here where he was born. This is the map of Uzbekistan. Look at Uzbekistan. Look here in the south, you have Afghanistan. Uzbekistan, there is a city here. What is it called? Bukhoro. That's the city, Bukhara. So that's where he was born, in Bukhara. You see where it is? It's not that far from Afghanistan, from Iran. Now why I'm mentioning this? Imam al-Bukhari was not Arab. You don't have to be an Arab to be a great Muslim. Imam al-Bukhari who compiled the greatest book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was not Arab. Look, he was where he was born, in Bukhara. So he was not Arab. Yes, he learned the Arabic, of course, and he spoke Arabic as well. But originally he's not Arab. So it doesn't really matter where you were born, who your parents are. Again, when I mentioned his lineage, his grandfathers, they were not Muslims. Yet, that did not prevent him from becoming one of the greatest personalities in history. That's Imam al-Bukhari. Okay. His father, now we're coming to his father. Who is his father? Was a student of knowledge. Ismail ibn Ibrahim. Again, we said Muhammad ibn Ismail. His father was a student of knowledge, and that was the seed where Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah prospered later on. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah himself, he said, my father shook hands with Ibn al-Mubarak. Who is Ibn al-Mubarak? Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. A great scholar. He was, you could say, a celebrity. He was one of the greatest also personalities. He was a great scholar of hadith, and he was a very rich man. So when, when a normal person shakes hand with Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, that's a good gesture of knowledge. You, 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 you learn from that that he was a student of knowledge. And he narrated from Imam Malik ibn Anas. Imam Malik ibn Anas, the compiler of Al-Muatta, again, the father of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he narrated from him. So again, that was the seed where Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, prospered later on. So this encourages you that you wanted to become a student of knowledge or you wanted your children to become great Muslims, you have to start within yourself first. Now we're moving to his childhood. We are starting step by step. Imam Bukhari Rahmullah, when he was young, he lost his eyesight. He lost his vision. He was not born as blind, but he became blind due to sickness. So his mother prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she kept praying, crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? She did not pray that she wanted her, her son to see so he would choose a nice wife. No, she wanted to produce a good Muslim for the Ummah of Islam. And she prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She prayed until one night she saw in her dream Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's telling the mother of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned the vision to your son because of your dua. Because of your dua. Look at this virtuous mother. Usually, usually, if the environment is good, you will find a good person. And if the environment is bad, then most likely the person will not become a good person. That's in general. That's not a condition. Because many times, even the environment is bad, yet still people are good. But in the case of Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, he was almost prepared. His mother wanted something good to come from her son. And as I told you in the previous session in the tafsir, when Ibrahim السلام, fulfilled his commands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him more. And the same thing, his mother had a pure intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her more. She never thought that her son will become one of the most famous people in history. Nowadays, 
I cannot imagine a Muslim who doesn't know Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. Look at this virtue for this Imam. It started with his mother. So that's a great thing. So again, now Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, regular person. He doesn't suffer from any deficiency. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with strong memory. That's the preparation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he memorized the hadith in early age, when he was less than 10 years old. Less than 10 years old and he memorized the hadith. Again, it's really important. The early age is really important. That's the first school. And it's our responsibility. What are we giving our children? What are we teaching them? What are they learning? Unfortunately, some parents, they say there is no hope or they, they only play. That's because that's what we are giving them. The children, most of them, they are smart. But it depends on how you direct them. What do you tell them to do? So from the early age, Imam Bukhari rahimullah started memorizing the hadith and his mother encouraged him. So before 10 years old, he memorized the hadith. He started correcting his teachers, correcting his teachers when he was 11 years old. When he was 11 years old, and his story was famous with his sheikh, Dhuhali. His sheikh was sitting and he was teaching his students. So he was mentioning the narration. And he said from Abu Zubair. So Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah told him, it's not Abu Zubair, it is Az Zubair. So the sheikh Khalid al Zuhali, he was very famous. And he rebuked Imam Bukhari, how come you correct me? He was 11 years old. I mean 11 years old, what do you expect from him? Yet Imam Bukhari rahimahullah insisted and he told him, go and check. So his sheikh went and checked with his books and he came back and he said, you are correct. He was 11 years old when he was starting correcting his shiuch. And he himself, he said, when I reached 16 years old, I felt that I got all the knowledge from my village. So I had to move on. Look, he did not say, Alhamdulillah, now I am the top, so people will come to me. He was thirsty to learn more and more. And he wanted to go to learn more because he knew that if he traveled, he will get more knowledge. And that's exactly what he did. When he was 16 years old, he went for Hajj. He took his mother and his brother and they went for Hajj. And he remained in Mecca to seek knowledge there. There were shiyukh in Mecca, Sufyan ibn Uyayna and others. So he took from the shiyukh, the scholars in Mecca. His mother returned with his brother, but he remained there seeking knowledge. They started narrating from him when he was 17 years old. So like, like an official sheikh, when he was 17 years old, he got lots of knowledge when he was 17 years old. And he started writing books when he was 18 years old. Before that, of course, he was narrating the ahadith and he was writing. Now, one thing about Imam al-Bukhari I have to mention, he did not like to write everything. Actually, when he was young, like 11 years old, 12 years old, he did not write anything at all. He depended, he relied on his memory. It was stronger than the writings. He used to go with his friends and they used to seek the knowledge. Now each one has notebook and a pen to write. He did not have. After some time, they blamed him. Every time they look at him, and they say, they wonder, why you are not writing? After some time, after they kept repeating, he said, look, you are bothering me. Tell me what you wrote. And they started telling him what they wrote. He started correcting what they wrote from his memory. His memory was stronger than what they documented. Nowadays, you may write something, and it turns out that you did not write it correctly. You misunderstood. He corrected their writings from his memory. So they knew that, He's impeccable. This man is, is blessed with this strong memorization. So from that early age, 
he was prepared to become a scholar. He wrote some ahadith and he memorized many ahadith, but he did not compile like books until he was 18. And he started with the disagreements amongst the scholars, the companions. That's an advanced level. You start first with this, the beginning, the introductions to knowledge. You don't start with the disagreements because you will be confused. That's why some people nowadays, they seek knowledge the wrong way. Because if you start from the top, you'll never reach. But you start from the bottom. You start from the beginning. So Imam Bukhari, when he was 18 years old, it's almost, he's done. He reached the top. That's when he started writing the disagreements of the scholars, disputes amongst the issues of the companions. They collected and they listed the shiuch he took from and they reached 1,080 sheikh. He narrated the hadith from more than 1,000 sheikh. Imagine this, 1,000 sheikh. Nowadays, unfortunately, if you study one day from one sheikh, you think that this is a big deal. Alhamdulillah, it is good. Even one ayah is great. But look at Imam al-Bukhari, 1,080 sheikh he took from them. Of course, people heard about him. They started learning that there is a great man with the name of Muhammad ibn Ismail. So he entered once the city of Belkh. It's called Belkh. Again, in the surrounding area I showed you in the map. So they asked him. They knew he is Muhammad ibn Ismail. They asked him to narrate to them from the ahadith. And he dictated from his memory, he dictated only one hadith from each sheikh. So he gave them more than 1,000 hadith. 1,000 hadith from his memory. He said, I will give you only one hadith from each sheikh I know. And he gave them more than 1,000 hadith. Now, on that age, when he was 17, his shiuch, his teachers, used to ask him to verify or to validate or to tell them which is correct. Now, Imam al-Bukhari, one of his famous shiuch, al-Humaydi, Al-Humaydi, he's a famous sheikh, and we will study him, inshallah, through the introduction. Al-Humaydi was arguing with another sheikh when Imam al-Bukhari came. And Al-Humaydi, the sheikh of Imam al-Bukhari, told the other sheikh, now we will ask him, now we will find out. And they asked Imam al-Bukhari. Look at the greatness of Imam al-Bukhari. From that early age, he used to decide amongst his shiuch when he was young. He says about himself, I memorize 100,000 hadith, authentic. 100,000 authentic hadith. And 200,000 unauthentic hadith. Quarter million hadith. That's what he memorized. Now that does not mean that's the only thing he encountered, but that's what he memorized. So definitely he wrote more, but that's what he memorized. Now, unlike our time when we say hadith, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ He starts with the sanad, with the chain of narrators. That's what they meant by 100,000 hadith. They did not memorize like us only the hadith, five hadith and mashallah. Now if I told you to list me 20 hadith only, could you list 20 hadith? Yes, you may memorize more, even more, but can you list them? He is telling you, I memorized 300,000 hadith. That's the true knowledge. But again, it was not earned by wishful thoughts, by sitting in your place. Look what Imam Bukhari did. He visited, he roamed the places of knowledge from his city Bukhara to Mecca, to Belkh, to Al-Iraq, Baghdad. That's how he gained the knowledge. Yahya bin Ja'far, he's from his city. He's contemporary to Imam al-Bukhari. He said, I wish if I could add to the life of Imam al-Bukhari from my own life. Look how noble is this wish. I mean, if you know that you're dying tomorrow, 
and they asked you to give up this day, you will never give it up. Not even for the millions of the earth. But Yahya bin Ja'far, he said, I wish if I could add to the life of Imam Bukhari from my life. Why? Because he said the life of Imam al-Bukhari is knowledge. When he dies, it's loss because we lose this knowledge. But when I die, I am one person who is dying. Look at how people acknowledge the greatness of al-Imam al-Bukhari. Now, we are reaching benchmark in the life of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, which happened in Baghdad. Baghdad, at that time, it was the capital of the Muslim state, Islamic state. So it had very significant situation, position in the Islamic history. Now, when this is the capital, just like nowadays, Washington DC, all the important people, VIP people, they are there. Baghdad, it was center, political center and also for knowledge. It was center, so there were scholars. Imam al-Bukhari was not from Baghdad. That was advantage and disadvantage at the, at the same time. But of course for him it was advantage. Why? Because people hear about someone, stranger, and no matter how much knowledge he has, they will try to belittle it. If he has great knowledge, he should be here. But because they heard a lot about Imam al-Bukhari, they were excited to meet with him. So when he came to Baghdad, again he was young. He was very young when he entered Baghdad. The scholars of Baghdad gathered to verify what they heard. They heard that the, memor the memory of Imam Bukhari is, is extraordinary. It's unbelievable. So they wanted to test him. They already chose, they picked 10 students. 10 students. And they gave each student 10 ahadith. 10 ahadith. Now again, as I told you, 10 ahadith means with isnad, chain of narrators and then the hadith. What did they do? They came to these 100 hadith and they chose all of them authentic hadith, known for people. They switched the isnad. Now the chain for this hadith with the text of it, they took another chain and they flipped it. So the hadith itself, the text itself is correct, but it doesn't belong to this chain. See what they did? Now, if I tell you this hadith, oh yeah, it's authentic because you hear this hadith. But the names are not for this hadith. That's a very difficult thing to know. That's what they did. And when he came, they said, let's test him. So they wanted to test him. First student came with the hadith, of course, with the wrong hadith, right? The text itself is correct. And the chain itself is correct as well. This man, he took from that man, he took from that man, but not for this hadith. You see how difficult it is? It's very tricky. So the first student, he narrated the first hadith. They asked him, Al-Bukhari, do you know this hadith? He said, no. The second hadith, no. Third hadith, until ten hadith. He said, no, to all of them. He moved. The second student, no. Again, the same thing. People started suspicious. Now, the people who have true knowledge, they said, he got us. He knew what's the trick. Others said, what's wrong with this man? He doesn't even know at least one hadith of these hadith until they finished 100 hadith. After they finished all of them, which he said no to all of them, he said, as per the first one, the hadith he mentioned, which is so and so, that's the correction for it, which is so and so. The second hadith, which he said so and so, that's the correction, so and so. What's great about this hadith, not only memorizing the hadith with the correct isnad, but memorizing the wrong hadith that they gave him. He did not have photocopier, he did not have tape recorder, he did not have camcorder. All he had is his memory. I mean, that's unbelievable. I cannot imagine one, even one person nowadays with that memory. Have you heard about a person like that? 
I mean, if I tell you 10 words, maybe you memorize them. But to memorize 100 hadith with isnad, the correct ones and the wrong ones, I mean, that's really unbelievable. When they saw that, all of them, of course, they were speechless. They said, that's a great imam. That's a true imam. And later on, from now on, he was called the Amir al muminin like, like the Khalifa of Hadith. He was the reference for the Hadith. That was part of the life of Al-Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. And after that, as each great scholar, there has to be a trial. There has to be a fitna. And that happened to Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, as well. He was tested with ordeal, with difficulty that it caused him eventually to die. And that's where we will start, inshallah, next session of the hadith. And with this, I will conclude the session. Is there any question? Of course, we took only the biography of Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah. Yes. Yeah, Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he was not Arab, but he learned Arabic. From early age, they taught the Arabic language, because you need to read Quran, you need Arabic. You need to learn the Ahadith, you need Arabic. They did not have translated books. So as a Muslim, Arabic was like a condition for you as a good Muslim. So he learned Arabic, yes. Any other question? No, yeah, did his parents, his parents spoke Arabic as well. As I told you, his father was a student of knowledge. You cannot be a student of knowledge at that time without learning Arabic. I mean, how can you narrate the hadith from Malik ibn Anas, rahimahullah? Imam Malik, he did not learn any other language but the Arabic. So his parents spoke Arabic as well. Any other question? Yes. Is it necessary for yourself to memorize Quran and Hadith before your kids? No, it's not necessary, but it is usually that's what happens. When you memorize the Quran, your children also will memorize the Quran. But we have many people, they memorize the Quran and their parents, they did not memorize the Quran. It could happen. But in general, when you memorize the Quran, and you'll encourage your children and they will memorize. But if you ask your child to memorize and he will tell you, you did not memorize, so I will not memorize. She's, just, she's also asking, like, for example, did his mother memorize a hadith too, or was she learning? I don't know. I don't know about his mother. Maybe and maybe not. It's irrelevant. But his father, most likely, yes. At their time, they did not pick and choose like what we do. No, they started the correct way. So that's the standard. You are a student of knowledge, you memorize the Quran. Yes. Uh, what was that you said about uh, Sheikh Humaydi in that he told to judge? Humaydi, he was disputing with another Sheikh. When Imam Bukhari came, and Imam Bukhari is the student of Al Humaydi, Al Humaydi told the other Sheikh, now we'll know the truth. Now we'll find out by Imam Al Bukhari by his student. Again, another great lesson. It's not always necessary that the teacher has more knowledge. You start with your teacher, just like his teachers. He surpassed all his teachers, all of them, including Imam Al-Humaydi, rahimahullah, including Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahimahullah. Imam Ahmad was his teacher, Imam Al-Humaydi was his teacher, but he surpassed all of them. Again, in, 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 uh, in Bukhara, when he was 16, he knew that there is no more knowledge he could get here. So he has more than his shiuch and he moved on. It's a year of death? Year of death. It's coming okay. tomorrow, inshallah. We did not discuss his death because, again, there are lots of stories about that. Any questions so far? 
Okay, we'll have a break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.